Tonight, we're going to look at the first several verses of James chapter 3, James 3 verses uh, 1 through 12. The subject matter is the tongue, and James is coming back to this particular topic. He had already mentioned it uh, in previous chapters, but here he elaborates on it with a lot of metaphorical language. So let's introduce this section uh, what we have when we think about James 3, 1 through 12 is talking about maybe one of the sure signs of maturity or immaturity in the way that we use our speech. And I think sometimes when we talk about the tongue, it's easy to think that when we use the tongue as, in means of gossip, slander, uh, maybe even um, cursing of some sort, that that's what is primarily at focus in this type of chapter, but it's not. I think what is at the center of this chapter is how the tongue is used to either build other people up or tear other people down to bless people or manipulate people. And you'll see that in a moment because he's going to single out in a moment teachers in particular. So, Bud, you and I are kind of in the crosshairs here tonight uh, in terms of how we use our teaching abilities. So here in the introduction, you'll notice that a couple of places earlier in the book, uh, we can take note that the tongue has already been referenced as a measure of maturity, and the reason so is because it's a, a powerful part of our body, but more importantly, it reveals uh, the condition of our heart or our internal world, and we're going to see in this uh, part of James that words have a power for either good or bad, and what we say reveals who we are, and how we say it can defile us in the sense of not just adding additional sins on our ledger before God, but how it defiles us is how it corrupts relationships with other people. So we'll see that come to uh, fruition in the first 12 verses. It seems as though James also is talking in cosmic imagery because of some of the imagery that he's going to use. It seems as though language has a world creating capacity or a world destroying capacity to it. So with that in mind, we're going to do what we did in the study from last week. We're going to look at it in bite-sized um, portions here tonight. So let's begin in chapter 3, verse 1 where teachers are singled out here as the prime example of the power of the tongue. It says here, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, that's anticipating the imagery that's going to come in a few moments where he talks about language being like a bridle on a horse, uh, talking about uh, it being a rudder on a ship, and has, in, has the capacity even to set the world ablaze. So let's hold those illustrations in check for a moment, and let's just talk here about the real peril here that I think James is introducing to us is not so much the passing angry word or the incidental promises that we make that sometimes we break, or even maybe petty slander that we uh, throw at someone. While all those things are bad, it doesn't seem as though it's what's at the heart of this. So you'll notice on this slide here that what's found within the world of language is the ability to distort meaning uh, with language. And when meaning can be distorted, truth can be suppressed. And I think James is probably using this idea 
as a way of saying, when an individual speaks forthrightly, it shows maturity. When they kind of hide the tr truth or shade the truth uh, or deny the truth, it shows a sign of immaturity. But when a teacher or a pastor or a president or someone in leadership position intentionally uses language and distorts meaning, it can become quite dangerous to those who listen. And James says here that, and he is talking about specifically the scribes and teachers of the law, that they will be judged more strictly by what they do with what they teach. So what we find here is a moment of self-reflection. Sometimes individuals uh, like to be up on stage. They like the spotlight. Uh, they like the attention. And when individuals speak, when they uh, teach, or when they pronounce something, what we find is that um, they will be held accountable for the way they've manipulated other people through their language because their motive is not pure. Their motive is self-centered in some ways. So verse one introduces this idea of the teacher and he talks about thinking uh, clearly about the fact that God expects more from those who use those type of gifts. So let me stop there and see if he has some thoughts or questions on verse number one. Verses two through four, it says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So let's stop there. And... He first is talking about the idea of being a perfect man. I don't think he's talking about the idea of perfection. I think what he's talking about is maturity. And if you look back at chapter one, what you'll notice beginning in verse 18 and following, uh, he begins to talk about the word of truth. In verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of fruit, first fruits of all he created. So God creates by the power of his word, and then he expects us to follow. And here's what he says, verse 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So here again is that verse that we already looked at. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. In our day and age, I think it's just the opposite. People are slow to listen, quick to speak, and very quick to get angry if we don't agree with them. But what we see here is in this uh, verse where it talks about uh, what we say is an idea of tying these two things together. That words in abundance can often lead to stumbling. That's what verse 2 begins to say. We all stumble in many ways. Um, where we stumble most is putting our foot in our mouth, um, saying things with a tone that has an edge or sarcasm to it. And what we find is that uh, we should be first hearers of the word and doers of the word before we be become teachers of the word. And what we find here is this idea of maturity again. 
it's found through this whole section that if we can co control our tongue, it is the best measure of maturity. And so we think of a president of, uh, 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 of a, a company or a school or the president of our nation. Um, and the inability to hold the tongue can lead to destruction. So I don't know if you're football fans, but uh, John Gruden, who is the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, just resigned because he couldn't hold his tongue. Now, he did it in the form sometimes of in, in emails, sometimes it was verbally, but there was a lot of misogynistic language, a lot of homophobic language that came out of him that began to be revealed. I mean, when individuals write things down in email, all of a sudden, it's proof, I mean, that can't be denied. Sometimes uh, individuals will say, well, you didn't hear me right when it's only verbal. But here, this guy um, basically lost not only a position as a coach in the NFL, but he was already in the ring of honor down in Tampa Bay because he led them to a championship a number of years ago. And the owner of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers took his name down out of the ring of honor in Tampa Bay because of this type of misuse of language and hurting other people and that type of thing. So here's a, a, a good example, contemporary, I mean, just as of yesterday type thing, uh, that we see the use of the tongue can lead to all kinds of problems. So it leads to problems not only for his profession, but think about this, what's the rest of the seasons gonna be like for the Las Vegas Raiders? They are, another person's going to have to jump in as coach and uh, somehow make the best of what's left in still a pretty long season. I mean, only five games have been played in a 17-game season. So there's a long way to go still. So let me stop there. Um, that's kind of my example. That's not James's example. He's going to use these, uh, these idea of bits and rudders. But um, I, I think just because it happened, a day or two ago, it's a it's something that we see right in front of us. Any thoughts, comments, questions? So he's going to give several reasons uh, why the tongue is a good measure of maturity. And the way he's going to do that is tell us three specific things about the tongue. And the first point that he's making here is the tongue is very powerful. So we already read verses three and four. Let's read verses uh, five and six. And then we have the whole uh, point that's being made. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. So very, very poignant imagery that's being used here. So notice the example, horses, ships, forest. Uh, so when you look at this, let's tease out the example for a moment. So the analogy of the bit and rudder are not about how our bodies are necessarily controlled by our tongues. I think sometimes we think that way, but how through our tongue we exert influence on other people. And that's what the rudder and that's what the bit does. It exerts a power over the horse, it exerts a power over the ship. So if we can control our tongues, we can use our tongues to exert great influence, um, just like uh, a, a jockey can upon a horse, uh, just like a captain can as he guides a ship. So those who, going back again to teachers or anyone that has the ability to influence, um, you can use that power to do good, or you can use that power to be destructive. So we just talked about John Gruden, um, and he did it 
in a way that became destructive to him and his entire organization. However, there are great examples uh, of people that use the power of language for the good of other people. And I think of Dr. Martin Luther King as a primary example who became, through his speech and the power of his preaching, uh, really a major force in the civil rights movement. So can you think of other examples, either good or bad, the power of the tongue, either doing good or being destructive? Anything come to mind for anyone? So then in verse six, he talks about setting the world on fire. Um, so if you had any chance to see the footage that um, of some of the types of fires that are happening out in California, uh, California, um, it really does set a whole community on fire. Um, a small spark, uh, whether it is because of global warming or because of um, the mistake of someone leaving a campfire uh, unattended or whatever it may be. Um, here he is saying that the tongue has a world of wrongdoing in it, if we let it be used that way. The tongue is representative of the uh, fire that's in our soul sometimes, uh, and it can really set a, a course of destruction in, in the path of other people. So notice he says here in verse six, the tongue is also a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. Now, think about this in contrast to the other parts of our body. Can we do evil with our hands and our feet? Absolutely we can. But it seems as though much of what happens in our world is done through in uh, some type of of provocative nature many times. Think about um, instigating things through language. Um, and I think that's what James primarily has in mind here. It has the idea of bringing damage not only to ourselves, but to other people as well. And of course, this is found in cross-references. Let me give you a few. Um, we might say that we pollute ourselves and it's reflected in what we say. So turn over to Matthew chapter 15 for a moment. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is going to talk about the use of the tongue. And in verse 10, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said to them, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Now, this could be in direct contrast to the Torah law, which has so many prohibitions upon not eating certain types of animals. But that's not what makes a person unclean. It's what's reflected in the heart and comes out over the vocal cords. And so Jesus is saying here that uh, our language shows some of the pollution that's within us. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, you have the book of Proverbs uh, that, remember, the book of James has a lot of proverbial type of feel to it. But in chapter 16, verse 27, it says here, um, a scoundrel plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. Isn't that an interesting parallel? A scoundrel plots cer certain evil actions, but it, when it comes out, when it is vocalized, when it is animated in some way, that's where it becomes like a scorching fire because it involves other people as well. And then one more in the Old Testament, book of Jeremiah, chapter 5. It says in verse 14, uh, 
Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty says, because the people have spoken these words, I will make my words in your mouth a fire, and these people the wood it consumes. Now, he's talking to Jeremiah here, and Jeremiah's commission is um, to speak forth truth to a people that don't want to listen. And he says, I'm going to make your words like a fire. And these people, the wood, it consumes. So that's pretty vivid imagery that you're thinking that the prophet here has the ability to set a community on fire, not literally, but figuratively. And uh, he goes on and says, oh, house of Israel, verse uh, 15, declares the Lord, I am bringing a distant nation against you, an ancient and enduring nation a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you do not understand. So what he's talking to Jeremiah about is the scorching fire that he is going to proclaim is there's exile that's coming. God's going to allow a foreign nation to come in and take you captive. So those very words um, will be like a fire uh, to the people that are listening to it. Now, when they go into exile... Jeremiah will later say, using words, that you're going to be there, but you're not going to, um, you're not going to be destroyed there. After a number of years, you will come back to the land. So his language will be used in a couple of different ways. So look at the bottom of your slide there. Uh, think about speech. Think about the power of the tongue in the world of advertising. Think about the influence of advertising. Think about whether it is accurate or whether it's inaccurate. Think about um, whether it convinces people to use their money in wise ways or overspend because language has built up such an expectation that they need this or that. It could be anything from warranties to you need a better model than what you have. So the world of advertising has a, an ability to set a fire sometimes. Or think about the language of politics, where we don't know what to believe sometimes because of the way language is used. Um, language in politics is often used to sell a candidate by lying about their opponent. So you know, when we come up to November's, when there's uh, elections that are around the corner, what we find is that there is all kinds of slander and outright lies, probably, that is used to manipulate um, those that are watching commercials, those that are watching advertisements. And um, what we find is that there's an entire agenda sometimes behind the language that we hear. So I think we all know that the tongue is very powerful. And of course, when you accompany language to social media, uh, I think we live in a very unique day and age where the world can be set on fire by using the language that we use, and it goes across Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and other social media. And sometimes it can really build momentum. Um, I'm just thinking about the people that showed up in our Capitol on January 6th. How did all of that come together? How did so many people uh, storm the Capitol? Well, they use uh, inflammatory language, I'm sure, across different platforms that built that type of momentum. And um, it can manipulate a crowd as well. Thoughts on that? So it's very powerful, reason number one. Number two, reason number two is it's untamable. So look at verses seven and eight. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed. And they have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a relentless evil full of deadly poison. Now, this is an interesting couple of verses. 
So no one can tame the, God, uh, the tongue without God's help. I think that's the point that James is trying to get across. But he is going to use the language of animals. Isn't it amazing that a horse can be tamed? Isn't it amazing that uh, sea creatures, whether it's a whale or a dolphin, can be trained? Now, much of this is Genesis type language. In verse seven, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed. Of course, we know that as we go back to the text, that Adam has this commission to name the animals uh, and he has the commission to, um, to exercise dominion over the created order, including the animal world. Uh, part of that probably is the ability to bring a, a tameness to wild creatures. So the creation story, uh, if you go back and you read it, distinguishes between land animals and the birds of the air and sea creatures um, and all that type of thing. What we find is the image, though, that it ends with here in verse 8 is it's a relentless evil full of deadly poison. So what animal comes to mind? A snake of some sort. Or So that probably is what's being picked up on in Psalm uh, 140. So I'm, I'm going to turn there. You can just listen. You don't necessarily have to go back there. But Psalm 140 and verse 3, as soon as I get there, Okay. It says here, um, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evil do doers. Let me not eat of their delicacies. So, one of the delicacies that they have um, is this idea of kind of like a forked tongue, the uh, idea of, of speaking lies, or if this has some resident, uh, resonance with Revelation 12.9, uh, the suggestion of the devil as the accuser, the one who brings blame. Um, maybe James has in mind um, a reference to the devil, I don't know. I don't, don't know if that he has that in mind for sure. But there's always a connection here <clears throat> in the scriptures between words and evildoers. So I'm going on in Psalm 140. Um, it says in verse 5, Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. When oh okay well it is, well it's applicable to uh, to speech isn't it oh yeah you're right i'm in 141 verse three okay yeah you're you're right sd psalm 140 verse three um they make their tongues as sharp as serpents the poison of vipers is on their lips so there's that image uh uh, of of a serpent, the idea of a viper. Then Psalm 141 um, talks about keeping a watch over. But he goes on here in Psalm 140, verse 4, Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from men of violence who plan to trip my feet. Proud men have a hidden snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net, and they have set traps for me along my path. So, He's talking in verse 3 uh, about using manipulative language that trips people up. Again, using figurative speech. Okay, thoughts there? Okay, third reason. Uh, shows the condition of the heart. I'm back in James chapter 3. And it says in verses three through nine, uh, nine through twelve. 
With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So we might say that praising God is the highest use of the tongue, uh, but over and against that is cursing other human beings who are made in the likeness of God. Um, that's what it says in verse 9. And, uh, it, and he is setting up kind of a, a contrast. How can we praise God with our lips and at the same time curse men who are made in the image of God? So the fact is that the tongue can do both these things at the same time. And uh, as it praises God and projects a certain image, um, at the same time, the true nature of the heart comes out by what is said toward other people. So he says, out of the same mouth come both praise and cursing. And then he gives another illustration. So he's talked about a uh, fire uh, forest. He's talked about a ship and a rudder. He's talked about a horse and a bit and bridle. And here he talks about fresh water and salt water coming from the same spring. So this whole section is loaded with figurative speech. Verse 12 says the same thing. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? So he's just kind of piling one illustration after another uh, in this section to make his point. So in all of these images uh, here in this section, verses 11 and 12, that of a spring, a fig tree, and a grapevine, um, he's making kind of the same point Jesus has said uh, in one case in chapter 6, verse 45 of Luke, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, and so the work of being a follower of Christ demonstrates its purest commitment, I think, in how we use our tongue. And you'll see at the bottom of the slide there, in this passage, James is saying that the best indicator of whether someone is a mature individual is the words that come out of their mouth. Fig trees cannot produce olives, no matter how hard they try. So I was thinking, how can, how can we get a feel for this? Um, so we've just looked at half of this chapter fairly quickly because it's primarily metaphors that are being used. What if we could see the power of speech in front of us as we observe speech being used? So what I did is I put together two video clips and each of them are gonna be five minutes or so. And what we're going to do is see the difference of how speech can bring about a positive effect or a negative effect. We're gonna start with the negative one first. And to set this up, um, how many of you watched The Office when it was running? No one? Okay. Anyways, let me set this up by saying, so there's an individual character um, played by Rain Wilson. His name is Dwight Schrute. And so he wins um, Salesman of the Year. So Dunder Mifflin is a paper company that sells paper, and he's a salesman on staff, but he would like to really uh, kind of become... Uh, the di director of the office, so the manager of the office. So the whole series is talking about um, a goofball that's the manager, Steve Carell plays him, and this Dwight Schrute, who is kind of a hard nose, in-your-face kind of individual. So one year he wins Salesman of the Year, and what you're going to see in this clip here is the speech that he gives 
at the na uh, national convention that he went to. And um, he is at first real nervous about giving this speech. So Michael Scott, his boss, played by Steve Carell, steps in, uh, in, in for him for a few moments. And uh, as he does so, his, his speech just, it goes over the edge like a lead balloon. Then Dwight steps up to the podium and he begins to speak, but what he did in order to write an acceptance speech for this Salesman of the Year Award was he looked at uh, a speech of a dictator. Well, that's just a little taste of a 13-minute speech that he gave uh, at the royal wedding. And um, I think it is a great contrast in the way we use language, the way we influence other people, uh, the way that words have a way of creating the vision of a new life. Uh, that's in front of us. And so I think all of this kind of pertains to James in the sense that he's talking about how words, the right words that are used at the right time and in the right way with the right attitude can bring about life. And when language is used to manipulate or to downgrade or to hurt other people, it sometimes brings about that type of um, situation that is not easily healed. So here's some quick three theological insights and you can look at the cross references that are there in, at your own leisure. The larger overall theme of the Bible when it comes to words is that the right words spoken at the right time with the right attitude bring life while the wrong words spoken at the wrong time with the wrong attitude bring about death. Secondly, because words have the power of life and death, evil words defile the one who speaks them, and each person must give an account of every word that they have spoken. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Over against these themes is the power of words. The Bible also presents the idea of useful lessness and meaninglessness and powerlessness of words as well. So you can kind of look at those uh, if cross references if you want, but I think that's a as a is a way of summarizing this section of James. So do any of you have any words? <laughs> Anything you want to mention tonight as we close off our study time? Okay, well, we'll finish chapter three next week and uh, appreciate you being a part of our uh, time together tonight. Hope you have a great rest of the evening. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, yep, you take care. You too.